when you pull up to game night in the all-new Camry. But it's actually bingo night. Mini golf, anyone? It's a Camry vibe. The all-new, all-hybrid Camry. Toyota. Let's go places. You never want to find yourself out on the water fishing without the essentials. So it's best to always pack a Columbia PFG Solar Stream Elite hoodie to protect against the sun. I mean, it provides great protection, and it's really breathable so you don't get hot. That's a win-win. Columbia PFG has a lot of great gear. So before you head out on the water, head over to Columbia.com slash PFG to shop their performance fishing gear. Be love with every heartbeat and every piece of Pandora jewelry. Let love shine on your favorite bracelets, necklaces, earrings, and rings. Or create a style that's all your own with a unique mix of lovingly crafted charms. From big feelings to small messages and everything in between. Love is at the heart of it all. Be love. Shop Pandora Jewelry today. Find a store near you or shop online at Pandora.net. I started to realize that not being an expert isn't a liability, it's a real gift. If we don't know something about ourselves at this point in our life, it's probably because it's uncomfortable to know. If you can die before you die, then you can really live. There's a wisdom at death's door. I thought I was insane. Yeah. And I didn't know what to do because there was no internet. I don't know, man. I'm like, I feel like everything is hard. Hey, y'all. My name is Kat. I'm a human first and a licensed therapist second. And right now, I'm inviting you into conversations that I hope encourage you to become more curious and less judgmental about yourself, others, and the world around you. Welcome to You Need Therapy. Hi, guys, and welcome to a new episode of You Need Therapy podcast. My name is Kat. I am the host. And before we get started, here is your quick reminder that although I'm a therapist and the podcast is called You Need Therapy, this does not serve as a replacement for a substitute for any actual mental health services, but we always hope that it can help in some way. So a couple of weeks ago, I actually posted about this on Instagram. If you don't follow me, you can follow me at Kat Van Buren. I did change my Instagram name. I'm walking towards officially changing my last name. And that is one of the steps that I have taken. So if you see that name and you're like, oh, I don't know who this person is. It's me. And if you want to follow me, you can Kat Van Buren. There'll be a link in the show notes to that. Anyway, I posted about this a couple weeks ago. So some of you may have heard this story, but I was laying on the couch watching TV with my husband around like 830 and the doorbell rang and I immediately went into a panic. And as my husband got up to answer the door, I said, do not open the door. Don't open it. Don't open it. I mean, I was in full panic mode. Then he peeked out the window and realized that the person who rang my doorbell was my two nieces and my older brother. And they were stopping by because they were in our neighborhood and just wanted to surprise us and say hello. And honestly, unless somebody explicitly tells me they're coming over, this is the normal reaction I have to a knock at the door or my doorbell being rang. It is panic. My initial response is to drop to the floor, to pretend I'm asleep, to hide, to wait until, to like, I like freeze until they, I know they're, they leave. And honestly, I take that back because sometimes telling me you're coming over isn't even enough to stop the panic. Because a couple years ago, I heard a knock at my door and myself and my roommate at the time both dropped to the ground and hid waiting for the person to finally leave. And it wasn't until my phone started ringing and I realized it was my younger brother and my sister-in-law coming over for the dinner that we had planned to have together. I knew they were coming and still I panicked when somebody knocked on the door. And I'm realizing that the panic that I have in those situations is oftentimes normal. It is oftentimes the majority that it is scary when somebody approaches your home, especially when you're not expecting them. And I really started to wonder why. And I asked this question on Instagram and you guys gave me various answers. But some of the things I was thinking about, like, has it always been this way? Is it something about our generation? Are we listening to too many true crime podcasts? Like what has been the shift in 
if it hasn't always been this way, what has been the shift in our culture and our society that has made this thing that seemingly, I assume at one point was very normal and welcomed, so scary? And is it specific for different people? Because not everybody has this experience. And I think there's a lot of things at play. One, I have to say before I get into this, I don't have the real answer here, partly because I didn't do any real research, like actual empirical research. But I also think that this answer is probably more complex and nuanced. There's not one thing that created this because this also doesn't affect everybody. But I do think that there is one thing that I have been looking into that has played a role in this and also has a played, a, played a role in a lot of the other parts of our social lives. And before I started really looking into this, I was wondering for myself if one of the reasons I felt this way was because of the kind of neighborhood I live in. And I don't know anybody on my street. I know people who live in my neighborhood, but I don't know the name of anybody who lives on my actual street. And I have lived here for four years. Now I have moved houses on this street. So I haven't lived in this exact house for four years, but I have lived on the street in the same pretty much general area for four years. And the community that I live in is a little different. Like there's not an HOA. There's not like a neighborhood community center or a neighborhood pool or anything like that, that I think would allow some of that to happen naturally. But I do see my neighbors sometimes. We just don't speak. And my neighborhood is different in the sense that there's a lot of diversity in it. That could be a benefit, right? Regardless, I think to me, that was one of the thoughts like, oh, do I get scared of the knock on the door? Because if it's my neighbor, I don't know them. And obviously, my neighbor wouldn't just knock on my door because we don't talk to each other. If something happened like an emergency and I needed somebody's help, I wouldn't be going to my neighbors. If I needed to borrow an egg or some butter or something like that in the middle of a baking project, I would drive to Publix before I would knock on my neighbor's door. And it hasn't always been that way. And I don't think that's it's that way everywhere. It is that way in the space that I live, or at least it is for me. And I was listening to another podcast on an unrelated topic as I was working on my art project turned uterus painting the last week. And if you know, you know, if you don't know, you can check out the reel I made on Instagram as well, but basically got this jolt of energy to create this thing I saw on Instagram that I couldn't afford. And um, I worked so hard on this thing and put so many hours and really enjoyed it. I put a lot of hours into it, but I really enjoyed the process of it. And when it was finished, I was so excited to go hang it in my office and I set it up and I immediately was like, one, this is ugly. Two, I found out it looked like I had painted a uterus. <laughs> so we'll be trying that again. Anywho, as I was doing that, I listened to a lot of podcasts while I was working on it and I listened to an episode of Be There in Five that I actually referenced on Couch Talks last week because it was talking about something relevant to that conversation. But in that episode, they also mentioned this thing called the third place and how we have a lack of them right now. So I did what I do best when I find interesting topics and I went on a little deep dive. And if you're unfamiliar with a third place is, it is a term that was created or coined by sociologist Ray Oldenburg. And it describes a place or places that are outside of your first place, which is your home, and your second place, which is work, where people go to just connect with others. And it's a casual environment where no one's obligated to be there. Finances do not and should not prevent someone from going to a place like this. And it's just basically a place where you go to connect with other people in your community for the sake of community and conversation. Productivity is not part of the plan. It's not about making something, creating something. It's literally just for leisure. And in these places, they're going to include people you don't know. They're going to include people you kind of know, acquaintances, and they're going to probably include good friends that you have as well. And one of the things that I really want to drive home there is one of the requirements for this is nobody's forcing you to show up and be there. It is something that you get to just choose. Now, some of you are probably going to be like, oh, I have one of those. And some of you guys are going to be like, huh, what? I don't. And also, who cares? But third places play a really important role in helping us build both individual and collective identities outside of the first and second place, the home and the workplace. So there's more to you than the roles you play at home and the roles that you play at work and what you do at work and what you accomplish there. They're social hubs and they really allow the space to bridge the gap in this loneliness epidemic that we've been having. 
And I know there are some people that are like, I'm more introverted and I don't really want a ton of social interaction. And so I, I don't really think that's necessary. And I hear that. And also I was reading an article from today.com called, do you have a third place? Here's why finding one is a key for your well-being. And in it, I'm going to read just a quote that I thought was important and, and speaks to that. Even if you aren't always an active social force in a third place, just showing up matters. It's crucial for people to escape from a sense of loneliness and build a sense of community. Some people go to a third place just to be surrounded by other people. Watch them and rest while just enjoying the ambience and white noise. And I totally feel that because sometimes I don't want to be the center of attention or put a lot of energy into something, but it does feel nice to be around something and, and be entertained in some way or feed off of the social energy of others. Now, historically, these kinds of places would be like parks or neighborhood coffee shops, bars, churches, places of worship. If you think of like the Central Perk from Friends, that's a third place or the bar in Cheers, that's a third place. And while those places still exist, they, I believe, exist in a different way in at least my world. There was another article I was reading in The Atlantic where the author Ali Conti wrote, the Ersatz third place is a consequence of a culture obsessed with productivity and status whose subjects might have decent incomes but little recreational time. Urban dwelling Americans, however, tend to place work at the center of life in part because cities are so expensive to live in. They might work a 50-hour week to survive, leaving little to no time for leisure and community engagement. Unstructured quality time with friends is replaced with a scheduled series of continuous catch-ups. Subsequently, these overscheduled people lack meaningful ties with their neighbors. Ding, ding, ding. And so they patronize spaces to make those connections even less frequently. And I think that there are a couple big reasons that these third places are not as prevalent or not as available or not as frequented. One of them speaks to what that quote was just saying. We don't have the time. We are living in a world that is so hyper-focused on success, on getting things done, on achieving, that the simple pleasure of connecting and connection becomes something that continuously gets pushed farther down on the to-do list. To the point, I think some of us stop even putting it on the list. At the end of the workday, you don't want to do anything. So you stop saying, hang with friends, visit somebody, have a conversation. I know me, I don't want to talk on the phone. I don't. A lot of times after work, I don't want to talk to anybody. I want to just zone out and watch TV. And part of that is because of how jam-packed and I think strenuous in different ways, all of work can be strenuous in all different ways, our work days are now. Where the simple act of spending time with new people can be an unnecessarily complex challenge, right? So if I don't even want to talk to a friend that I know really well, I definitely am not going to have the energy to do something that is genuinely simple to go and talk to somebody the idea of doing that has become so big and I think really does genuinely feel so big. We make it bigger than it used to be. Part of that is because we don't do it anymore, right? We haven't had the energy to do it. So then now doing something like that feels even bigger than it would have been if we do it more often, right? Starting is the hardest part. So it starts to feel bigger and harder and really that avoidance perpetuates the magnitude of what socialization really is where it feels like it takes more out of me than I get. And if I'm going to do something for fun, I'm probably gonna prioritize these big things that I wanna put on my list than the small, you know, just have a conversation with somebody random or go into an experience where I don't know I'm gonna get out of it. I'm going to fill my calendar, my social calendar with the things that I want to attend versus these things that I could take or leave. And Life in general, I think, is more complex. It's interesting. We're in summer right now, and I think summer, oftentimes, it's like, oh, we're going to have so much time to rest and see each other and do things. But then summer ends up being less of a break to slow down and more of a little blip of time because we've packed so many things in that space. And I have this experience, I feel like, every summer where I think I'm going to have all this time to make these random hangouts or see people or do things, but I'm doing so many things that I have had planned for the summer that I don't get to do the everyday regular things. 
The best way to describe the first time I put on a pair of cozy earth pajamas is that it was a spiritual experience. So much so, I immediately went online and bought my husband a pair of the men's bamboo joggers and the men's bamboo lounge t-shirt, and I don't think he took either of those off for at least a full week. You can stay cool and comfy during long flights with Cozy Earth's temperature-regulating bamboo joggers and their pullover crew, adding a touch of style to your travel ensemble. Whether you're exploring distant lands or enjoying a staycation at home, Cozy Earth has everything you need to turn every moment into pure bliss. Discover your next destination for ultimate comfort at Cozy Earth. Visit CozyEarth.com and use our code UNEED at checkout to get 30% off and let them know that we sent you after you check out. CozyEarth.com, code UNEED. Oh, hey, we're invited to the Johnson Summer Pool Party this Saturday. I said we'd bring our famous potato salad. Oh, Saturday? But that's when the blinds guy's coming to give us a quote. Those appointments take forever. Oh, yeah, I meant to tell you. I already found everything we need at blinds.com. They're totally online, so we don't have to wait around all day just to get a quote. I talked to a blinds.com designer, and they're sending us free samples. Oh, blinds.com? I've heard of them. Yeah, they've been around for over 25 years, but not everything. Everyone knows they can also handle the measuring and installation for a fraction of what the other guys charge. Plus, they have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. (laughs) Well, Blinds.com sounds like a no-brainer. Guess I'll cancel. Already done. That gives you time to make the potato salad. Uh, Yes, dear. Shop Blinds.com now for summer savings up to 45% off. Save up to 45% at Blinds.com. Blinds.com. Rules and restrictions may apply. You ever get that feeling like the concrete jungle's closing in? You crave wide open spaces, the chance to chase your own dinner, or just breathe clean air. Well, listen up. There's a whole world out there waiting, and finding your piece of it just got easier. Head over to land.com. They've got ranches, forests, mountains, you name it. Search by acreage, price, location. They've got it all. No matter what kind of wild dream you're chasing, land.com can help you find the ground to make it a reality. So quit dreaming. Head over to land.com, find your open space, and get out there. So not having time is a big part why these third places don't so much exist. The other thing is there's so many other ways we find leisure. And I think that has to do with just the way our society and culture has shifted, especially with the development of different things. And, you know, think about TV and television and and that kind of entertainment. You used to watch an episode of a show every week, right? So if there's a show I liked, I would, you know, watch it on Thursday nights. And maybe there's two shows on Thursday. I don't know. But now we're getting shows in the entirety, right? So instead of spending an hour watching TV, I could be watching TV for five hours and not be bored. And there could be also a million different TV shows I could be watching because of streaming services. And let's say you don't even you're not even watching shows like social media sucks us in. As the world has changed, the way we have entertained ourselves has changed dramatically with it. Instead of things like Bunko Groups, we binge watch entire television series, like I was saying, in one evening. That's the social thing that I'm doing. That's the leisurely thing I'm doing instead of hanging out with friends and having a good time in that way. And it feels easier and I'm already so exhausted from the workday. I'm more likely going to just want to lay on the couch and do that than have to put the effort to then go have those conversations and those experiences. We can lose two hours, more than that sometimes, scrolling TikTok instead of having an actual conversation at a local spot, whether that's a restaurant, a bar, a coffee shop, or a community center. We can get stuck just scrolling our phones. And instead of having these real conversations with people about current events, we can tweet at people, people that we have probably never met and probably will never actually meet maybe not even ever interact with again after we tweet at them. And I think, again, part of that's because we're exhausted and part of it's because our social muscles have like atrophied. We haven't been working them. We haven't been using them. And so it feels, again, going to back what I was saying earlier, doing this other stuff sometimes feels impossible. It feels so hard when I think it used used to be like a natural instinct. P.S. As I was 
developing this episode and writing some stuff down, I started thinking about those bunko groups and I literally had to take a pause and started to like actually organize a bunko group <laughs> because I want that. Like I want those things to feel more natural and I want to feel excited about them. And I know a lot of people are doing book clubs and stuff like that. Side note, three quarts therapy might be developing something like that soon. But I also wanted something that felt more, I'm more of a lover of board games and all that than a, a reader. And it's something that I remember my parents doing, having these monthly groups where all their friends would get together and they would have so much fun. And we still have those, people still do that. But I want us to have more of it. And I want it to be like a normal experience for us versus this, oh my gosh, that sounds like so much work. I don't want to commit to that. It's another thing on my calendar if socialization and community is important, then I have to start prioritizing it so it does not feel like it is such a burden versus it is part of my life. It also makes me think about how I went on a walk last weekend with Patrick in a park near our neighborhood, which normally I think in the past could be considered a third place, but we don't really communicate or talk to anybody else at this park. And also when it comes to parks, I think a lot of communities created these things for third places, for shared community and environments. And as the world has shifted, it's kind of creepy to walk up to a stranger at a park now. Like if you're hanging out at a park and you're laying by yourself somewhere or you're on a walk, there's a lot of stranger danger, I think, that we're experiencing as well. So that plays a role in this. But anyway, we were walking and as we were walking, we passed a woman who made a casual and kind upbeat comment to us and our initial reaction was what a strange thing to do <laughs> you know talk to a stranger say hello to a stranger and after Patrick and I talked about the interaction for a second I was like we are the weirdos we are the weird ones the fact that you would complain or think it's weird or like scoff or whatever when somebody says hello and makes a friendly comment that maybe who knows maybe they were hoping for a conversation or to spark something and that was their intro into it the fact that I think that's weird that is weird <laughs> somebody was just being friendly and I think that kind of explains some of this social exhaustion I go to this park and I complain about having to see people that I know because I so often want to go on a walk to relax and decompress but I want to completely disconnect from everybody and I don't want to have to stop what I'm doing or share that experience with somebody. And I do think that there's a time and a place where like, yes, we need our alone time. I, I, that's not what I'm saying at all. But I think that my knee jerk reaction of needing so much of it or being so exhausted by the interactions that I do have that I don't have space for these just leisurely, just for joy communications because maybe I'm exhausted at home or exhausted in the workplace that I think is part of an issue really that I see where our communities are so divided right like I don't know my community because I don't have the social energy to do so when that could bring so much more joy and help in my life and bring us together versus create this such individualized separate than polarizing experience we're having in our communities now I also think that speaking to this like idea that there are so many different ways we find leisure is part of the issue with this is not just that we aren't going in public to find our leisure. I think another thing that plays into that is there are so many more opportunities and options. Like there are so many options to have and there are so many places to go depending on where you live. Instead of just going to the neighborhood coffee shop, I live in Nashville, there's a new coffee shop to try every month. There are all these new places and it feels like the establishments that have been around here the longest are closing down more often than staying consistent because of so many of these new places and you know how we are. We love newness. We love shine. We love excitement and the safeness and the, I won't even say the health and the normalcy of going to the same places becomes very boring and we're tired of it because maybe we're not talking to people when we're there. Those places are, are going away more often and all these new places are popping up. And I think that's the same with restaurants. It's the same with your neighborhood bars. I imagine this feels different depending on where you live. I think there can be different roadblocks when it comes to this idea. 
maybe in some rural places there aren't enough options. Maybe there's no options at all. And then places like I am right now, there are too many. And these old establishments with the nostalgia can't keep up with these new fancier places that are coming in or they're getting bought and turning into something else. And then those places become these revolving doors. There are so many buildings around here that stay open for less than a year and people keep putting something else in the same spot and nothing sticks. And we've almost like lost trust in the establishments, I think, because they come and go so fast and they're not around long enough for a community to really be solidified, especially at the rate that we're going to them, right? That we're going to them regularly. So then that leads me to this third idea that I think is kind of roadblocking us into having these third places that we used to have more regularly. And that is just our social skills. And I have think I've layered that into what I've already said. And it sounds weird because I feel like this is also something that should be advancing versus trending down. But the more technology that adds to the ease of our lives, like the different streaming services, like the social media, like all these different things that adds ease to our lives, is also stealing opportunity for us to develop, to develop as people, to develop as groups, to develop our own skills in different areas. One of those skills being our social skills. I was talking to somebody the other day because I, I used chat GPT for the first time, which is such a weird thing to me. It scares me a little bit. And I was talking about like, how are we going to develop our writing skills? How are we going to develop our critical thinking skills? How are we going to develop our problem solving skills when we have these robots that just do all of this for us? And so there's that, but it's also stealing from our social skills and Social skills are skills. They, they're things that we can learn. Like we can have more of a natural way of leaning into that, just like any other skill. But it's also a skill that can be and is often learned through our experiences and through our communities and our surroundings. And a lot of us are really out of practice. I, I mean, even just the idea of small talk can be so difficult these days. People don't know how to do it. One, because we don't like it. I could go on a whole different conversation around that but a part of it is it scares us because we just don't know how to do it and everything's awkward and I mean I'm the first to make a joke about that I I even posted the other day about my fear of going as I was doing my art project turn uterus painting I I had to go and talk to the people at Lowe's and ask them to cut some pieces of wood frame for me and that took so much out of me it was there was nerves around it for different reasons but these things that used to be so simple, going to the hardware store and asking for some help or, you know, being in line in the grocery store and start talking to the person next to you, they're scary. We don't do them. And again, like the woman that said hello to me, people think that they're weird <laughs> and I don't think that they need to be. And so it's interesting because one of the most common frustrations I hear in my office centers around the difficulty in finding and maintaining friendships and community in adulthood. I think that the individualism that has helped us grow in so many ways has also stolen an essential part of creating a meaningful life. Like we can move to a new city and follow our dreams, but we can't go to a bar and sit down and strike up a conversation with the person next to us. And again, there's a host of reasons of of where that comes from and, and why that is. But if you're asking like, okay, but who really cares? Like, yes community. Yes. It's one of the reasons maybe you're scared of the person that your door. Why does this really matter? I really think these third places matter for so many reasons. One, like I mentioned, the lack of these places really does play a role in the loneliness epidemic we have been facing for the past, I don't know, decade, but we've actually been paying attention to for the past couple years. Like that didn't start with the pandemic. I think it was exacerbated by it, which honestly might've been a good thing. So we did start paying attention to it. But the difficulty of finding friendships and maintaining those friendships and maintaining social connection and the the issue that there aren't places that we can just show up and be seen and see other people in the way that we used to have these places, to me, it is something we should be concerned about. Like we're so worried about, and sometimes we think we're, we're worried about the collective culture, but a lot of times we really do overcorrect in this selfless versus selfishness where there has to be a middle ground, where I want to be involved in a part of my community and I I want to take care of 
others and I want to take care of myself. Those things are allowed to coexist. I think I talked about this about the overcorrectedness we do with like setting boundaries. It's all of a sudden we're cutting everybody out of our lives versus just setting boundaries or knowing that there, I, I might need some extra self-care in some areas or people can be problematic, but it doesn't mean that they're toxic. Like we've, we've just overcorrected in a lot of ways that has also ripped opportunities away from us. And people don't have to be all good and all bad all the time. There can be a middle ground and I can still share positive experiences with people that aren't perfect in every way. Oh, hey, we're invited to the Johnson Summer Pool Party this Saturday. I said we'd bring our famous potato salad. Oh, Saturday? But that's when the blinds guy's coming to give us a quote. Those appointments take forever. Oh, yeah, I meant to tell you. I already found everything we need at blinds.com. They're totally online, so we don't have to wait around all day just to get a quote. I talked to a blinds.com designer, and they're sending us free samples. Oh, blinds.com? I've heard of them. Yeah, they've been around for over 25 years, but not every Everyone knows they can also handle the measuring and installation for a fraction of what the other guys charge. Plus, they have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. <laughs> well, Blinds.com sounds like a no-brainer. Guess I'll cancel. <laughs> Already done. That gives you time to make the potato salad. Uh, yes, dear. Shop Blinds.com now for summer savings up to 45% off. Save up to 45% at Blinds.com. Blinds.com. Rules and restrictions may apply. You ever get that feeling like the concrete jungles closing in? You crave wide open spaces, the chance to chase your own dinner, or just breathe clean air. Well, listen up. There's a whole world out there waiting, and finding your piece of it just got easier. Head over to land.com. They've got ranches, forests, mountains, you name it. Search by acreage, price, location. They've got it all. No matter what kind of wild dream you're chasing, land.com can help you find the ground to make it a reality. So quit dreaming. Head over to land.com, find your open space, and get out there. Zero Foxtrot isn't just a brand, it's a way of life. Founded and operated by veterans, Zero Foxtrot's unique apparel and gear echoes the grit of the warrior culture. Zero Foxtrot dedicates itself to producing content, honoring the sacrifices of forgotten heroes of the past, and connecting history to the present. Embark on a journey with Zero Foxtrot today at ZeroFoxtrot.com. It's not merely our products, it's about the ethos that we embody. Rugged, resilient, and timeless. I really do think that this is part of the issue that we have dividing us as a, an entire country, not just individual communities. In the same article in the Atlantic that I referenced earlier, there was a professor at Colorado College that was quoted saying, a world made up of atomized, physically isolated people is a world without true shared reality, which is a recipe for civic disengagement, misinformation, and perhaps even political extremism. And I'm not getting into the politics of all of this. That's not what this is really pointing at. It's actually pointing at the issue with it, right? The lack of socialization within our community is creating more polarizing divides between us. The simple conversations aren't happening anymore where we can enjoy parts of each other and shared positive experiences before we make an opinion that's opposite of the halo effect based on certain beliefs that we do not share or we assume that we do not share. We are not finding ourselves in spaces where we are sitting and having normal, calm, less extreme conversations about certain topics because we're just not having conversations at all. And I, I really do think the lack of a third space creates a lack of the wider community, almost where community becomes a luxury and to some a burden versus the way in which we survive. I honestly sometimes think we're like scared of people, not in the sense that like I'm scared of the person at my door. I think it, it turns into that, but we're just scared of people in general because what we do end up seeing because we are not sharing spaces and having conversations with these diverse people and having communities that are not all or nothing, we see the extreme sides of things because that's what we're seeing on things like social media. That's what's being platformed on there. And so I think as much as we're afraid of what others think, we are afraid of what other people think of us. Like we don't want to get into these conversations or have conversations about certain things. We tiptoe around things and then we end up avoiding them at all costs, honestly, because we assume that the majority of how people think and know and what people know and how smart people are and all of that stuff is we're comparing that to what we see on 
social media and that's such an extreme version of what how most people live and what most people know and how most people just work and operate the less I keep using the word extreme but it's I mean the less polarized the less loud the less angry like the lesser of those voices isn't shared and so we're just not talking to anybody and that's actually what I talked about last week on couch talks when I was talking about answering a question on a listener who was sharing that her and her partner don't have the same political beliefs so they don't know how to have conversations about it we're so scared all the time but my greater point in that is that by not having these third places by not having these community centers when I say that I like think of like the old community center like a senior citizen center, something like that. But I just mean like community centers, like places where people just feel safe to come and like chat and you see the regulars and you meet this person, their acquaintance, and then you're able to say hi to them at the grocery store. And then maybe you see them at the soccer complex when your kids are having a game. And we just have a wider net of of human beings in real life. But the ability for us to not have these spaces where we meet these people and we have these conversations are keeping us in these tighter, more almost like dungeon-like circles of community. It often feels like the communities that we're in are these separate, very almost like elite or exclusive social clubs that only certain people are allowed in and out. And it's hard to get in and or it's hard to even know where they are. We just separate ourselves so much versus come together. And there's something to that, the like exclusivity. There's honestly, there's so much psychology behind that. I think I would love to research the science of that because exclusiveness is attractive, right? You want things that less people have, right? That's what makes certain items more like oh, there's only three made in the world. So they're more expensive. They're of more value. If less people are allowed into this social club, they're of more value. And I think about like the Soho houses of in the different cities. It's you have to apply to get in. And if you have a membership and they're expensive, so only a certain type of person can even afford to be there. That's not a third place because money is not supposed to keep somebody in and out of this. Anybody should be allowed to show up and be there if they want. And I even think about how fitness has changed where third places might have been the gyms. Like when I grew up, I grew up in a neighborhood that had a community rec center and to go work out at that rec center was like $2. And I think there's actually a place like that around here as well, where like to take a class at one of these centers is like two or $3 versus to take a workout class at these boutique fitness studios, they're upwards of 30 bucks. And I think part of that is one, it's a business they're making money versus they're funded by the government or the ta- whoever, but also there is, I think, a part where people want to create that exclusive feeling where like to be here and to be seen as special, which is an issue I think that I think there is with the fitness world and that like wellness and health should not be a luxury or a privilege. It should be something we are all allowed to be a part of. That is really tough. And then when we find ourselves in those exclusive social clubs or scenes, then we are creating almost like echo chambers. We're either not having those conversations where we're not hearing different opinions because we're scared of each other, or we're surrounded by people that all do think the same and we're not having really fruitful conversations. And so we almost get so amped up on what we believe and everybody around us is amping us up. And then when we are hear something that goes against that, we want to fight versus go, oh, I've never thought of it that way. Tell me more. Or, oh, you know, I don't agree with that, but I still might like you. Like they become the enemy. Maybe this is why I'm coming back to this idea that someone coming to my door felt like an invasion of privacy, right? A panic, a threat versus an opportunity to connect with somebody or a fun surprise. There would be no good reason for someone to be knocking on my door if I wasn't expecting somebody. That's the thought, like, what would the reasoning be? Because that doesn't happen versus it would be a normal part of our world. An unexpected addition to our day versus a burden to have to talk to somebody. It would be a good thing if we experienced it being a good thing more often, but we just don't. And because I don't exist in a world where my neighbor might pop over, the vast majority of knocks on my door will end up being from people that I don't want to be there. (laughs) 
So that's going to be where my brain is shifting. Now, they might not be all people that are going to come rob me and murder me in my home, but they might be salespeople or they might be, I don't know. But because that is what I'm getting, I have nothing to compare it, it to. And I think my takeaway through this is one, I'm going to start a Bunko group. I've already sent out some texts and I will hold myself accountable for that. And it will be not just like my core group of friends. I want to invite people from different areas of my life into that. And also the idea of we can continue to add people to that and people can rotate in and out of it. It doesn't have to be this fixed thing. But my other takeaway is I read this line in the article from today.com that I mentioned earlier. And it said, we need physical spaces for serendipitous, productivity-free conversation. And that really just like sums it up for me. (laughs) We need spaces where the goal is enjoyment rather than networking for work or gaining social status. Because when that's the goal of social interaction, it does feel like work. And when we're already exhausted by work, obviously we don't want to go do more. We're going to resort to those easier to relax experiences that strip us from actually really honing in and developing social skills that connect us and benefit our health. We need places where there is an us mentality, right? Versus a better than or a scared of or a against them where the opportunity for unplanned moments shared is really welcomed versus feared. So my challenge for you, one, if you have a third place, I want to hear it. I want to know what it is. I want to know what it's like, what kind of place you even live in, right? If you live in a big city, if you live in a more rural era, if you live in the suburbs, like tell me about your third place. If you don't have one, let's find one. And again, they don't have to be the Bunko group, right? There are any places where you can go and connect with people. And the connection can be just a simple conversation with a stranger, In one of the articles I was reading, it was telling about how she went, I don't know, somewhere on some meditation group or yoga class or something on her way back. She saw this building. She was curious. So she went into it and it was kind of like a a social club for the neighborhood, like a community bar or something like that. And she had a conversation with the bartender and they learned something about each other and she enjoyed meeting this stranger and it actually filled her cup up more than the yoga class she went to, which is so interesting because so often... When I'm going to the gym, I'm not talking to anybody. I go in and I go out. Like that's not where I'm even finding this, I don't know, exposure to people that I think we expect to find in those places now because we're so just stare ahead that whole individualism idea. I'm going to go do what I need to do and I can't have anybody get in the way of it where I kind of want, want to let somebody get in the way of it. There's a neighborhood pizza place where I live that I love. I would love to be one of my third places. And I went with a couple friends months ago and sat at the bar. Sitting at the bar is such a fun experience and also can be really scary. But there was a person sitting at the corner that we didn't know. And he just started talking about, I don't know, the game or something that was on TV. And we had a whole conversation with him for our whole meal. I've never spoken to him again. I probably never will unless I run into him again. But it was fun to talk to him. And it didn't steal anything. It actually brought some thought-provoking conversations between me and my friends later. And what if those kinds of things were exciting versus a bummer or avoided? I don't know. Maybe I would be less scared at my brother knocking on my door. Maybe not, but I am willing to try to find out. So find a third place or tell me about your third place and let's do our own part to shift some of this loneliness stuff. Let's create more spaces for people to be able to connect versus more spaces for us to avoid each other. That's what I'm going to end with. So I hope you guys have the day you need to have. I will be back with you on Wednesday for Couch Talks. If you want to follow me at Kat Van Buren, at Uni Therapy Podcast, at Three Quarts Therapy, and talk to you later. You ever get that feeling like the concrete jungles closing in? You crave wide open spaces, the chance to chase your own dinner, or just breathe clean air. Well, listen up. There's a whole world out there waiting, and finding your piece of it just got easier. Head over to land.com. They've got ranches, forests, mountains, you name it. Search by acreage, price, location. They've got it all. No matter what kind of wild dream you're chasing, land.com can help you find the ground to make it a reality. So quit dreaming. Head over to land.com, find your open space, and get out there.
This is it. We've got an Amex Platinum Pro on our hands, ladies and gentlemen. We haven't seen anyone relax like this before in the Centurion Lounge. <sighs> is he connecting to complimentary Wi-Fi? Oh, my. Look at that. He is. And you will not believe where he's going next. The Amex dedicated card member entrance for the win. Unbelievable. When you get travel perks with Amex Platinum, you're part of the action. That's the powerful backing of American Express. Terms apply. Learn more at americanexpress.com slash with Amex. Zero Foxtrot isn't just a brand. It's a way of life. Founded and operated by veterans, Zero Foxtrot's unique apparel and gear echoes the grit of the warrior culture. Zero Foxtrot dedicates itself to producing content, honoring the sacrifices of forgotten heroes of the past, and connecting history to the present. Embark on a journey with Zero Foxtrot today at ZeroFoxtrot.com. It's not merely our products. It's about the ethos that we embody. Rugged, resilient, and timeless.